Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Okay, so let's get started again. Um, our next spe speaker is uh, Ben Lundell uh, from University of Washington, and he'll be speaking on derivatives of piatic L functions. Thank you. Is it on the screen? <laughs> oh, there we go. Great. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say this is actually this has been really great. I enjoyed the talks today. So um, hopefully I can uh, keep up with the standard that was set before me. So I want to talk about uh, derivatives of piatic L functions, which is a project I've been uh, working on for the last about year with Ralph Greenberg, who is also at the University of Washington. And it's something that uh, uh, has a sub substantial contribution from uh, Xiaowei Zhang, who I've actually never met, but also worked with Ralph on this project uh, in years past. So uh, I will start at the very beginning uh, from your calculus class, uh, where we have this sort of formula that at least I try and show whenever I'm doing infinite series, is that the sum of the reciprocals of the squares is pi squared over 6. And the sum of the reciprocals of the fourth powers is pi to the fourth over 90. And uh, maybe I don't get any further than that. But if you go to the Wikipedia page for the Bessel problem, you'll, you'll find all sorts of great formulas that, that tell us that if I look at uh, positive even integers n and I evaluate the Riemann zeta function, which should be every number theorist's friend at those powers, I have some very interesting thing. It, it works out that I get some sort of transcendental factor, uh, this pi to the n, times uh, a rational number. It's, it's some power of negative 1. I divide by 2 times n factorial. And then I have this bn, this Bernoulli number, which is the, uh, the, the coefficient in the Taylor series expansion of t over e to the t minus 1. All right? And these Bernoulli numbers, of course, they pop up everywhere in math left, right, and center. Uh, presumably, everyone has encountered them in some different application from what I'm going to talk about today. And, and this is just one more. Uh, but of course, they're rational because right, these are both power series with integer coefficients. So when I take this fraction, I'll get a power series with q coefficients. Uh, but of course, the zeta function has a functional equation. That's how we know we get some sort of uh, analytic continuation to the whole plane. I guess in the case of the zeta function, there's a pole at 1. And so uh, this lets us relate, uh, oh, maybe that should say zeta of 1 minus n, or put some restriction on n in some way. Uh, but this, this is nice. This tells us that at odd integer values, uh, I have uh, no transcendental factor. I just get some rational number. Right? So uh, it's minus bn plus 1 over n plus 1. And this even makes sense for if the 1 was in there, which it should be zeta of 1 minus n. Uh, this would even make sense that it doesn't depend on the parity of n because uh, when the, the subscript is odd, the Bernoulli numbers are 0, with the exception of n equals 0. So uh, there are some restrictions here. So more generally, we can take a Dirichlet character. Of course, the zeta function corresponds to the trivial, the trivial character, the trivial Dirichlet character. So if I take a non-trivial Dirichlet character, I can uh, define its L series in much the same way as I define the L series for the trivial one and get the zeta function. Uh, and I can twist this uh, definition e to the t over uh, t over e to the t minus 1. I can twist this uh, by the values of this Dirichlet character and get some what are called generalized Bernoulli numbers. And the same sort of formula holds. The L function at 1 minus n, depending on this uh, Dirichlet character psi, is some generalized Bernoulli number divided by n. So now let's let p be an odd prime. Uh, and around the 1950s, uh, Coomer proved this sort of amazing congruence of Bernoulli numbers, which says that uh, bm and bn are congruent some modulo p to some high power, 
Well, almost B m and B m, I have to, you'll see these correction factors out front, 1 minus p to the m and 1 minus p to the n. They're congruent very, mod a very high power of p, provided that m and n are congruent mod, uh, well, that same high power of p times an, another factor of p minus 1, right? So they're a little bit more congruent. So uh, I want to maybe think about this in the way that Kieran talked about uh, p attic numbers uh, earlier today, right? So we, we saw this idea of taking integers and looking at their p attic valuation and looking for the highest power of p that divides it. And then what well, we took 1 over p to that power. So the higher power of p that you were divisible by, the smaller your absolute value was. Right? So in other words, the closer to 0 you got. Right? So what this is saying is if I sort of think of these if m and n as inputs to some function, right, it's saying that if m and n are very close, sufficiently close, in other words, congruent mod phi of p to the a plus 1, then the outputs of this function are congruent mod p to the a. So in other words, I start with, uh, right, and of course, being congruent mod p to the a means if I take their difference, that difference is highly divisible by p and therefore close to 0, right? So that difference is small. So what I've got are inputs to some function that are close together that give me outputs that are close together. So we can think maybe that these Bernoulli numbers form some sort of continuous function, right? There's some sort of continuity property going on with these Bernoulli numbers. Uh, and despite that, that's sort of a very clear argument that you might want to make, it, it took another 110 years before anyone actually realized that this was, in fact, the case, that, you know, these are sort of, they're piatically continuous. And uh, uh, Kubota and Leopold realized that these things up here, these top, which, which are essentially values of the zeta function, are piatically continuous. So we would hope that we could come up with some sort of piatic analog of the Riemann zeta function. Right? And, and you know, more generally, these Bernoulli numbers, we had the generalized Bernoulli numbers, so hopefully we can more generally get some sort of piatic analog of this complex, um, uh, in the case of this L function, uh, complex analytic function, right? So but this is a very sort of amazing property, right? You, you have this crazy complex function, and somehow you want to be able to turn it into a completely number theoretic object with this piatic um, zeta function or piatic L function. So I'll set some notation uh, that we're going to use basically for the rest of the talk. Uh, for some technical reasons, I want psi to be an even Dirichlet character, non-trivial. Um, for the odd Dirichlet characters, everything works out to be 0, so it's not that interesting. So we'll stick to an even one. P will always be an odd prime. And omega will be the p adic Teichmuller character. Uh, the easiest way of thinking about this is it's just a, it's a character with conductor p, such that if you give it any integer, its value at any integer is congruent to that integer mod p. Right. Uh, it actually takes values in, well, it's going to take values in the p minus first roots of unity. And if you think of things in the right way, those are embedded in the units of zp. We'll see this later on. Um, so this, this will sort of play a prominent role. Right. And the uh, Kubota Leopold p adic L function, it's a p adic analytic function uh, of one variable. This will, we'll, we'll see some two variable p adic L functions later on. Uh, which is uh, sort of uniquely characterized, right? The integers uh, are dense in the p adics. So if I know what, it, what a function does on the integers, I know what it has to do everywhere, especially a, well, a continuous function anyway. And this is, these are continuous. They're analytic. And it's the unique one that satisfies this uh, interpolation property. So on the, on the left, I have my p adic L function, right? My p adic analytic function. On the right, I have my complex function. But there are a couple of things to note. First of all, I have to twist it. I have my character psi, but I have to twist by powers of this Teichmuller character omega. This is absolutely a standard thing. In the world of p adic L functions, you, you have your complex analytic object, and the p adic L function somehow encodes information about twists of that by Dirichlet characters. Right? And I also have this, this funny factor out front, which is essentially 
related to these, these 1 minus p to the m and the 1 minus p to the n's. These are Euler factors, right? They have the Euler factor for the zeta function, the, the product decomposition. The, uh, I have the same sort of product decomposition for the L function of the, the Dirichlet character. So I have to remove these Euler factors because when, when you think about it, these are p's in the denominator. And in zp, p is not invertible. Everything else is, right? All the other integers that aren't multiples of p are invertible. p is not invertible, so I don't want that in the denominator. So I somehow remove this uh, corrective, this, this Euler factor to turn everything into something over zp. Uh, of course, the second line is just uh, reminding you all that, that special values of the complex L function are just Bernoulli numbers. Right? And that's, again, this, I mean, this really is where this, this p-adic L function comes from is this second line, because these Bernoulli numbers are what we know are p-adically continuous. Right? They interpolate. So there, I've left it up there for you. Right? That is, uh, that's the interpolation property. And this is value, this is uh, valid for all n bigger than or equal to 1. So I want to see what happens when n equals 1. So we'll just plug it in. Right? Well, of course, the left-hand side becomes the p adic L function evaluated at 0. This is quite interesting. right? It's an analytic function. You can think of it as a power series. So this is just going to give me the constant term. Right? What's the constant term of this power series? And I don't, I mean, there's no, uh, you know, there's no content to, to the right-hand side. I've just plugged in n equals 1 and, and done a little shorthand notation. We're going to let psi 1 be psi omega inverse. It'll, it'll be fixed like that for the rest of the slides. We'll come back to that, that character. So there's no content there, except this b1 of psi 1. Right? Earlier I made a comment that uh, these Bernoulli numbers were 0 for odd indices except at 1. Right? You, when you look at the function t over uh, e to the t minus 1, it, you play around with it a little bit, and it's almost an even function. Right? It's almost an even function, but not quite even. And uh, the only problem is you have a, in the power series expansion, you have a coefficient on t, and that's it. There's no coefficient on t cubed, t to the fifth, or anything like this. And the same is true with these generalized Bernoulli numbers. So this b1 will definitely be non-zero. And why is that interesting? Well. That means the only way that I can have a 0 at s equals 0 for the p adic L function is if psi 1 of p is equal to 1. Right? That's, that's, that's the, that, that forces it to be a 0, and that's the only way it can be a 0. Right? And so this psi 1 of p, this is something that you can easily, you know, if you know psi, you know psi 1 of p. Right? There's absolutely no confusion on how that happens. Right? So this is a very special class of character. So we get it, and we have this 0 if and only if. OK. So you have a function. You know it vanishes at 0. Your next question should probably be, what's the order of the 0? Right? Does it vanish once? Does it vanish twice? Could it vanish to any degree power? How should this work? And uh, fortunately, we have an answer from this. Uh, it's due to uh, Bruce Ferraro and Ralph Greenberg. And they've said that if it vanishes, right, that it can only happen if psi 1 of p equals 1 then the derivative is definitely non-vanishing. Okay? Uh, well, there we go. Right? The order of the 0 is 1. And you'll note that that's exactly one more than the order of the 0 of the complex L function. The complex L function uh, takes on the value the Bernoulli number. And the Bernoulli number is non-zero. So it has order of vanishing 0. The p adic L function has order of vanishing 1. So I will uh, very quickly go through the proof in about three lines. Right? Uh, so the first thing that Ferrar and Greenberg do is they prove a formula. They actually prove a general formula. They don't, they don't make the assumption that psi 1 of p equals 1. They prove a formula for the derivative at 0. But when psi 1 of p equals 1, it simplifies to this, which is uh, well, it's just some linear combination of p adic logarithms of a p adic gamma function. Okay, so you know what a logarithm is for complex numbers. If you know what a gamma function is for complex numbers, we can define p adic analogs of them. Right. Uh, D works out to be the conductor of psi 1. So at, at almost exactly the same time that uh, Ferrar and Greenberg were proving this, Gross and Koblitz were considering something like this. They were considering this p adic gamma function evaluated 
at these rational numbers c over d. And I, I'm not going to go too much into what their theorem says, but uh, it relates these, these p-adic gamma functions at c over d to Gaussian integers, right? Or to, sorry, Gaussian sums, to sums of roots of unity. And the key point there is that roots of unity are algebraic numbers, so Gaussian sums become algebraic numbers. So this formula up on this top line becomes some algebraic combination of p-adic logarithms of algebraic numbers. But there is a theorem that was first proved by Alan Baker for the complex setting and then proved by uh, Brumer for the p-adic setting, which tells you that p-adic logarithms of algebraic numbers are algebraically independent. Right? So there's no way for some algebraic combination of these to become 0. Right? So there we go. That's the, the proof in general. Right? OK, so that's sort of the, I never know how to think of this. I guess that's the zero. It's either the zero dimensional case because you're thinking of fields, or the one dimensional case because you're thinking of characters. And then we can go to the one dimensional case because you think of elliptic curves, or the two dimensional case because the Galois representation is now two dimensional. But either way, that's sort of the base case, right? Well, we can go up one level, right, and talk about elliptic curves, right? Just like a Dirichlet character, I have a complex L function attached to an elliptic curve. So uh, one might hope, and uh, one would be rewarded for their hope, that there's a p-adic L function attached to this complex L function coming from an elliptic curve. Uh, so this was done in. Uh, by Mazur and Swinnerton Dyer in the 1974, maybe, and then sort of redone and, and rethought out in, in the mid 80s by uh, Mazur, Tate, and Teitelbaum. I think they got p adic L functions in more general cases. I think now we, uh, thanks to Rob Pollock and, and uh, some of his collaborators, we have them in, in, lots of, in lots of cases and for modular forms. And, and we, we We've got p-adic L functions when we have complex L functions for, at least in, in sort of the two-dimensional Galois representation case. Um, so uh, when I say semi-stable reduction, I'm happy for it to be good ordinary or, or um, multiplicative reduction. So here, there's a, a similarly, right, I have this interpolation property that tells me how does my p-adic L function relate to values of my complex L function. Uh, uh, hopefully, as we all know, the relevant value for the, the complex L function is s equals 1 for an elliptic curve, right? That's related, uh, excuse me, it's, it's very closely related or is the main content of the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. So this is certainly what everybody who's talking about L functions of elliptic curves is interested in is this value at 1. And so my interpolation property when I figure out what it should be at 1 tells me that the p adic L function at 1 should be, again, just this the complex L function at 1, I have to divide by some, some complex period. In this case, this is, uh, comes from the invariant differential on the elliptic curve. This is the standard, standard period that you would find in, say, Silverman's book. And this, this Euler factor gets pulled out, right? 1 minus AP to the minus 1. Uh, if I have good reduction, then AP is you know, related to the number of points mod P. If I have bad reduction, then AP is some sort of appropriate generalization of how that works. Uh, and the case I actually want to focus on is when I have bad reduction. If I have split multiplicative reduction, then I know AP is 1. Right? So if AP is 1, then necessarily the, the, the right-hand side vanishes, so the left-hand side vanishes. Okay? It's important to note that in the case of elliptic curves, right, L1 of E can vanish. Right? In fact, if you know about when L1 of E can vanish, you should probably write a paper about that. Right? This is this is a big hard question is when does it vanish, when does it not vanish? This is you know, related hopefully to the rank. Um, but at least I know when I have split multiplicative reduction, my p adic L function vanishes. Okay. Uh, it might be the case that it was already 0 because of the complex L function, but who knows. Uh, so the theorem in this case, which was also uh, uh, Ralph was involved in, Ralph Friedberg was involved in, this time with Glenn Stevens uh, from the early 90s, is that the derivative of the p-adic L function is related to the value of the complex L function at 1 times some extra factor. Right? In this case, it's log p of q over the ord p of q, where q is this Tate period for E. Right? So when I have a, um, 
an elliptic curve that has multiplicative reduction. I have sort of a p-adic uniformization theorem, much like the complex uniformization theorem, right? This is what Tate proved. And it produces this parameter q, which basically uniquely determines my elliptic curve over qp. Uh, and of course, it, tell, it gives you exactly what the j invariant is, so it really does, right? Once I know the j invariant, I know the curve, at least over qp bar. Uh, if you're worried ord p of q can never be 0, it's related to the uh, power of p dividing the j invariant of e, which, since I have bad reduction, the j invariant has to be divisible by p. Right? And it should also note that a couple years after this paper appeared, um, it was proven that q actually must be a transcendental number. Little q must be a transcendental number over q. Uh, properties of the p-adic logarithm say that then it can ever, can't ever vanish at transcendental numbers, right? It vanishes at powers of p times p, p, p power roots of unity, which are all algebraic. So since that's transcendental, the log doesn't vanish. So that means this factor out front, this corrective factor, log p of q over the ord p of q, is never 0. So that tells me I knew that the p-adic L function vanished, but its derivative only vanishes if the complex L function vanishes. So, uh, well, I guess maybe we don't know quite that. But it, we get the same idea, right? That the order of vanishing should be one more, right? The order of vanishing of the p-adic L function should be one more than the order of vanishing of the complex L function. All right, so we proved the first result. We'll prove this one too. We'll go very quickly through this proof also. All right. So this proof is very different than the first proof. The first proof, uh, uh, Ferraro and Greenberg was very, uh, they went straight through and it was very classical Iwasawa theory. They did, they worked with Stickelberg elements ex explicitly and reduced a bunch of sums to get their formula and proved everything, proved everything that way. This proof is a little more uh, modern. I mean, it came 15 years later, so that's maybe not too big. Uh, to be shocked, but they really, they used Galois representations in a very fundamental way. And, and the, the big idea is that, uh, going to it, are, are the fact that we no longer view this elliptic curve by itself. Uh, it's modular. I guess we know that now. Uh, I think maybe when they wrote this paper, they had to assume it was a modular elliptic curve. Um, and thanks to work of Hita, we know that if I have a modular form, say, in the case of elliptic curve, a modular form in weight 2, uh, and, an or, and, and an ordinary prime, then I actually can find a modular form in every weight that is somehow has, has the same mod p representation, right? I have this Hita family. I have all of these modular forms that are linked um, in having the same mod p representation. And wh wh what that will actually lead to is actually some sort of two variable p adic L function, right? You have one variable, which is your normal variable. And one variable, which is your weight. And the weight 2 case specifies to the p adic L function for the, the weight 2 elliptic curve right? that's there. If you plug in k equals 17, then it's going to give you the p adic L function attached to the modular form of weight 17 that's in this same Hita family as E. Okay, so it's sort of a packaging together of all of this information and all the different possible weights for the one mod p gal representation that we have. So the special properties that this p adic L function have is if I restrict to the line s equals k over 2, right? So k is my weight variable and s is sort of my, my interpolation variable. Well, then the p adic L function vanishes, right? Vanishes identically. Right? If instead I uh, take the partial derivative with respect to k and then evaluate that at 1, 2, so I have in the weight 2 case, um, that's going to correspond to the p adic L function of E. 1 is going to correspond to that value that we cared about. So this should be related to the, der the derivative, the k derivative at 1, 1, 2, right? So very closely related to the thing we care about. They actually prove that this is some, some number alpha of p times the value that we are interested in, right? The, the complex L function at 1 divided by the complex period. And so uh, again, this is now back to some basic calculus. I know the direction. I know a direction where the function vanishes, so it's all of its derivatives vanish on this line s equals k over 2. And I know a formula for the partial derivative with respect to k, so that's the, that's the direction s equals 0. So if I want the derivative uh, in the k equals 0, 
which is, or k equals 2 direction, right, which will correspond to the piatic L function for my elliptic curve, I just need to, well, figure out the right vectors and, and add these derivatives together, right? So what they needed to do then is just compute this AP, right? So this sort of formula just falls out. All they need to do is compute this alpha P. And to do that, it's, uh, it's all Galois cohomology. Right? It's, it's very much working with Galois representations and their cohomology and um, what are called Selmer groups, which we'll see pop up in a little bit, to study how uh, this AP can vary with different weights and so forth. So this then raises a question. I've proposed two very similar problems right, uh, with two very different solutions. Right? So in the one case, we started with characters. In the second, second case, we started with elliptic curves. Uh, and the question becomes, can I find a two-variable proof of the Ferraro-Greenberg theorem? Right? As I said, the, the Ferraro-Greenberg theorem was very much a classical Iwasawa theory thing. Uh, but maybe there's some way we can attach a two-variable piatic L function and try and mimic the proof of the Greenberg-Stevens theorem. So uh, yes, yes we can. That's essentially the content of this talk. Uh, and so what I want to do for the rest of the time is, is uh, give a sketch of how we can do that. Right. Uh, so we'll just remind everyone of the setup. P is an odd prime. P isn't always an odd prime. It's actually funny. I was taking a class once, and somebody, the uh, it was John Coates was teaching it, and he wrote p minus one or p minus one over two on the board in some computation, and someone raised raised their hand in the class and said, uh, "Why are we sure that's an integer?" And John immediately said, "Oh, oh, p p is odd." He said, "You know, p is always always odd." He said, "I always thought that." You know, if you had someone you didn't like, you gave them the p equals 2 case. Because you knew it would work out, but you didn't want to be the one who had to work it out. Right? So I don't want to be the one who works out the p equals 2 case here at all. Uh, so p will be an odd prime. Um, so chi is going to be the, the, the cyclotomic character. Right? It's going to be the, the character that gives the action of the absolute Galois group of q on the p power roots of unity. Of course, this is going to take me into the um, zp cross. Okay. And uh, as promised, uh, omega will, will make an appearance here. Z zp cross right, can be written down as the, the p minus first roots of unity plus uh, things, that are congruent to, excuse me, things that are congruent to 1 mod p. Right? These are the multiplicative units in the p addicts. And uh, omega is essentially the projection onto that first factor. Right? Omega, this technical character that we talked about the first time, is the projection onto the first factor. It gives me my uh, action on the p minus first roots of unity. So I'm going to call the projection onto the second factor kappa. Right? And kappa is going to be a, a, a homomorphism from the Galois group of q to 1 plus pzp. Well, if I look at its fixed field, right? this is just basic Galois theory. I'm going to get some extension. This is q infinity. This is the cyclotomic ex ZP extension of Q. This is what Iwasawa looked at in his original papers in the late 50s and you know, really got the start to this um, to Iwasawa theory. Uh, it is, this is the only extension of Q infinity whose Galois group is ZP. Or the only extension, sorry, the only extension of Q whose Galois group is ZP. Uh, and so finally, if K is any number field, whose degree over q is not divisible by p. Uh, I mean, that's just a sort of a handy assumption for right now. Um, this q infinity is a p power extension, right? Uh, zp is a pro p group, so this is a p power extension at each stage. So then k is disjoint from q infinity, so I can take this compositum and not worry about anything. And I get out the cyclotomic extension of k by just taking this compositum. Right, so this. You know, this you can think of as very closely related to just throwing in all p power roots of unity to k. All right. So we need to now get our two variable p attic L function out of somewhere. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to a quadratic field, uh, an imaginary quadratic in field, no less. And here's how this is going to come. I want to pick, pick one where p splits, 
So I have these two primes, p and p bar, sitting above p. And these two primes are going to define two different maps into 1 plus p z p. I should say 1 plus p z p is, is isomorphic to z p, if, if that's not immediately clear. Uh, you can think about it at dinner, and it will be. Um, the, the map kappa is the same map I just described on the last, last slide. right? It's just this. It's just giving this uh, projection onto the second factor of zp cross. Uh, the map lambda comes from this second zp extension that k has. So I said q only had one. Well, it turns out that k has, well, k has infinitely many, but k has, you can think of it as sort of a, a rank two or a two-dimensional thing over zp. So I can pick two generators. So we'll pick two generators. We're going to pick this cyclotomic zp extension. And I'm going to pick another one. And it's the unique one which, in which um, p bar is unramified. So these extensions have to be ramified. They can only be ramified at p. They can't ramify at any other primes, or you know, whose norm, the norm of any prime that ramifies has to be p in this case. Um, and so there is a unique one, which is unramified at p bar. And so we'll define lambda to be this map that sort of factors through that quotient Galois group. And so this gives me two separate maps to 1 plus p z p, kappa and lambda. And uh, they both, being in 1 plus p z p, it, it makes sense to raise them then to any power in z p. So if you're congruent to 1 mod, mod p, I can raise you to a p attic power, no problem. Uh, you run into some issues if you're not quite congruent to 1 mod p, but you can get around those two at some point. OK, so just as a reminder, psi 1 is psi omega inverse. Um, and I want to, we're in this case now, psi 1 of p equals 1. This was the case where my p attic L function, my Kubota Leopold p attic L function vanished. Uh, so we'll let f be the field that's cut out by psi 1. It's the, fixed, it's the field fixed by the kernel of psi 1. And we're going to let k be any imaginary extension which satisfies p splits, so we can be in the setting of the last slide. And I want it to be disjoint from this field f, so that I don't have to worry about any overlapping. This is super easy. right? You can, you can always make this happen. And this disjointness means that if I restrict psi 1 uh, to the Galois group of k bar over k, I just get some character phi that looks exactly like psi 1. Right? There's, no, there's no issue of being hidden, any kernel elements being hidden in k bar over k because they're disjoint. OK. So in this case, right, uh, for this character phi, uh, uh, cats has defined a two-variable p attic L function. It sort of comes from the complex multiplication that I have going on. Um, and I, I'm not going to talk about the interpolation property or any of this or that. Just know it's defined on continuous homomorphisms from the Galois group of k to qp, QP bar cross. And well, we have some homomorphisms like that already, right? We have kappa and lambda. And I have this, this character phi that, that, that goes in that group too. So I can look at phi times kappa to the s times lambda to the k for any s and k and zp cross zp. And I can write um, L script p of sk to be this two variable p attic L function um, that cats defines, right? So I can restrict the domain of these continuous homomorphisms and get a two variable p attic L function. So the cats did this all in the mid 70s. So this has been around a long time. Uh, this is the, this this line. I sort of am only starting to understand. Ralph is slowly explaining this to me, but um, right? To I mean, so we know if we have a, a character of an imaginary quadratic field, and we have a Hecke character that's going to correspond to some modular form. That's Old news that was known in, I guess, probably in the early 1900s. Um, but when you go to this two variable p attic L function, this is exactly the idea of this HEDA family. So I have now a CM modular form, and I have other modular forms of different weights who are somehow related to my one in weight two. So, so we have this two variable p attic, p attic L function, s equals k. Uh, so when k equals 0, that's when this lambda part drops out. I can think of this as a one variable p attic L function. I just have this kappa part. This is the cyclotomic direction. right? It corresponded to the cyclotomic uh, extension. Uh, uh, Dick Gross has a factorization result, which is uh, 
very cool, right? It says that if I just look at the cyclotomic direction, then I can write my cat's two variable p-adic L function as a product of Kubota Leopold one variable L functions, right? So it's LPS psi times LP1 minus s, and I twist, um, I twist psi1 by the character that corresponds to the quadratic field k. Well, this is convenient because, first of all, if I take s equals 0, I already know that L, uh, the Kubota Leopold function vanishes at 0. I'm under that assumption that psi1 of p equals 1. This is what we're our running assumption now. So I know that the left hand term vanishes, so I know that this. Uh, this two variable p-adic L function vanishes at the origin. And moreover, if I, if I look at now the s partial derivative and evaluate at s equals 0, well, again, half of the, that one term is going to, you know, you do the product rule and one of the term drops out. And I get the derivative I care about, the Kubota Leopold function at 0, times some other Kubota Leopold function evaluated at 1. But the value at 1 is sort of well known. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a section in Larry Washington's book on cyclotomic fields. It's, you know, it is well known what this is. And it works out that it's some, you know, up to some constant factors that aren't really important. It's p-adic log, it's a sum, it's a linear combination of p-adic logs of cyclotomic units. Right? So we, we really understand what that is. So in the other direction, we looked at the, uh, we got rid of lambda, we just looked in the kappa direction, that's the cyclotomic direction. When we get rid of kappa and we look in the unramified at p bar direction, uh, Katz has a p-adic analog of the Kronecker limit formula, which basically tells me that when I take my derivative there, evaluate at 0, it's some constant times some linear combination of p-adic logarithms of elliptic units. Right? And I mean, this is nice too, right? We understand elliptic units, we understand cyclotomic units. We know how all of these, how these should work. right? And so what we, we have is the derivative in two directions. And we, we need to relate them somehow. right? Because if I know I, have, I only have two directions to go, right? I, I said I sort of had these two places I can look. And if I know the, the derivative in two directions, uh, if I can get a third direction, then I, can, then I know I have a relationship. Right? And then I might be able to say something about this term LP prime 0 psi. That's the one I care about and relate it to these other known terms, the log p's of cyclotomic units and log p's of elliptic units. Right? But I said we vanished at the origin. So I mean, I can write it then as a times s plus b times k plus a higher order term. And certainly, the partial with respect to s evaluated at s is 0 has to be a. And the partial with respect to k evaluated at the origin has to be b. So if we can find a direction such that the linear term vanishes, Right? So I find some, at some, some line where, this, uh, where I have a double 0, so to speak. Right? Well, then I'll have a relationship between a and b. But a and b, we said, are these things that we want to relate. Right? So uh, really, what, what Ralph and I have been working on is this, finding this direction where you have a double 0 and, and how to do that. Right? That's really the meat of what we've done, uh, thanks to lots of other hard work by people I've already mentioned. Right? That's, that's sort of the new thing we're bringing is how to get this direction. So I'm going to uh, maybe go through this in not much detail in, in sort of an easier case, and maybe do it a little quickly. Um, so I want to just make a technical assumption that makes explaining things much easier. Psi 1 is going to take values in ZP. Um, normally, it can take values in some extension of ZP. And, that's sort of the hard part, is working out how to generalize what I'm going to explain to you to that case. But it's all doable. So I let delta be the Galois group of f over q. Remember, f is the field that psi 1 cuts out. Um, so psi 1 is a character of delta in particular. And uh, I'm going to look at the zp extension of f on which delta acts by psi 1. So already, right there on that line, I've already used the fact that psi 1 takes values in zp. Um, and I'm just going to let capital script p be any prime of m above p. Doesn't really matter. Now, psi 1 of p equals 1, and psi 1 cuts out f. So that means when I localize f at a prime above p, it splits completely and I get down to qp. So that means when I localize m at this script p, I get some zp extension of qp. So then I have some now zp extension of the local field qp, and 
class field theory tells me it's determined by this universal norm subgroup. So uh, this field K tilde or QP tilde, anytime I put a tilde over a field, it just means I take the maximal extension, which is a compositum of ZP extensions. So for K tilde, I already showed you there were two. Those are the only, there are only two independent ones at any time. Uh, so I get a ZP squared. It turns out uh, a very fun exercise in the very beginnings of local class field theory it tells me that I only have two ZP extensions of QP. So those two have isomorphic Galois groups. So I can find some ZP extension of K, which I'll call D, some field D, which has a Galois group over K of ZP, that uh, corresponds to this extension uh, M script P over QP. Okay, so it, by corresponds, I mean, you know, if I complete D at some prime above P, I get the same field, the same completed field. Okay, so now if I take a topological generator, so this Galois group of K tilde over D, well, Galois group of K tilde over K is ZP squared, and the Galois group of D over K is the quotient ZP, so the Galois group of uh, K tilde over D must be, must be some very close to a ZP extension, right? So it, this is also another group that's ZP. Um, if I take a topological generator for that, uh, then, then this then powers of kappa times lambda uh, factor through d over k precisely when this top row they they take the value one at that generator. Okay, there's sort of almost no content to that theorem statement. That's just basic Galois theory. Right. So reevaluating that though, right? Kappa to the s lambda to the k delta equals one. Well, if I just take the piadic logarithm of that. Then I get out a line, right? Log p of kappa of delta times s, log p of lambda of delta times k is equal to zero, right? So if I can compute for this d, right, or any d I take really, this topological generator, that gives me a line. So that's how zp extensions give me lines to, to evaluate my two variable p at a function mod, right? So that means the two things we need to do that are left are show that our choice of D, this sort of, it's been picked out to be the one which corresponds to some action of psi one, is the direction where I have a double zero. And the second thing I need to do is then sort of compute what this topological generator is so I can compute its, its uh, logarithm and, and actually get the coefficients for the line. So uh, this is the beautiful part about all of this. Right, at least to me, since I am very firmly someone who knows much more about algebra than anything even vaguely analytic. Uh, thankfully, many people who understand both of them very well have worked very hard and have proved uh, some main conjectures, right, which tell me that this sort of p-adic analytic object, this, this L function, this p-adic L function, uh, very concretely relates to a galois cohomological element, right? This is just completely galois cohomology and it's called a Selmer group. And it's just, in this case, it's some module over power series in ZP with two variables, right? And uh, generally speaking, if someone talks about Selma groups, this is, this, the name Selma group I'm 100% certain comes from, if you know Selma groups for elliptic curves, it's the same idea, right? And it's just, it's a, it's a subgroup of a uh, global Galois cohomology group whose, co whose co-cycles satisfy uh, certain local conditions when I restrict to the decomposition groups above prime. Okay, so uh, for the Selmer group we care about, the, the, the property we want to have is unramified. I have some global cohomology class and I want it to be unramified at any prime except possibly at the, the prime script P. I'm allowing ramification there and only there. It's unramified at, at um, P bar. It's unramified at any prime not dividing the rational prime P. Okay, so my those are my local conditions. So to show that I have a double zero in the direction coming from D, uh, what I do is I just I show that I'm annihilated by this ideal x y squared. I'm, I'm annihilated by this uh, prime ideal x y squared because uh, after all, S K is uh, the the piadic L function is the annihilator, and so somehow if there are no linear, linear terms in the annihilator, then there can't be any linear terms 
in the p out of gal function, and so I, I have a double zero, right? If I restrict to this direction, so that's why this I switched here from a Selmer k total to a Selmer d. That sort of you define different Selmer groups for different extensions of k. Um, it's not that important. They're all it's all the same idea. Global cohomology classes restricted down to a local condition. Uh, so. How do we actually prove that this is annihilated by this, the square of the ideal x, y? Well, it's a, it's a very careful analysis of exactly the local condition at the prime p bar. There's really nothing going on at primes not dividing p. We won't want to put any restriction on the prime p. So the only thing that can possibly give us any information is the prime p bar. And uh, we show that somehow this extension d, the one that we've picked out, corresponds exactly to the global cohomology classes, which are 0 when I restrict to the decomposition group at p bar. Not just unramified, right? They don't just give you an unramified extension. They're, they're 0. OK, so this is, um, I think, sometimes referred to as the strict Selmer group, if you're familiar with Selmer groups. Um, and uh, it's, it's almost just like a formal consequence. Once you sort of show that this actually is maps to 0, you just have some exact sequence. And then you're sort of left with no choice but to say that the, um, the quadratic, there are no linear terms in the annihilator. OK, so it's sort of showing that this is the case is, is really the, the crux of how you get this a double 0 in this direction. So once I have this double 0, um, we still need to calculate a topological, topological generator for this Galois group, right? I said once I have that, then I can compute this line. I can compute the coefficients, and then I'm happy. I have the relation I need. Um, but this can be done basically via local class field theory. Um, you look at the Artin map. You you fiddle around with it for a little bit, and about a page later, you you have what your topological generator needs to be. So that does it. We have. Um, we have proved it. We have that if psi 1 of p is 1, then the derivative is non-vanishing. We did it with two variable p at l functions. Uh, and kind of the important part right, in this was in the original proof, I talked about uh, uh, Ferrar and Greenberg proved some formula that had linear combination of p at logarithms of the p at gamma function. Then they had to apply this theorem of Gross and Koblitz about this p at gamma function. Um, the gross koblitz theorem, I, I don't know it very well. I, I certainly haven't studied the proof. But it's not necessarily what you would think of for sort of an, a piatic Iwasawa theory type proof. I mean, they go on and they're studying Jacobians and, and stuff like this. It's a very geometric proof. Uh, but we avoided that completely. But of course, the Ferraro Greenberg theorem is still true. So uh, our plan, once this preprint of what we have is actually written up, our plan is to, to go back and try and see if we can take uh, what was done 30 years ago uh, and what's been, will hopefully be done by the time I have to start teaching in the fall, and uh, come out with a new proof of the gross Koblitz formula um, that is really I mean, this is definitely Iwasawa theoretic in nature, right? I mean, these are all, everything that's been gone into our version of the proof is constructing measures and, and uh, you know, integrating characters and all of that stuff. Very, very classical Iwasawa theory type argument. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you. I think I'll stop there. Gupta talking about work, his work on a conjecture that Ralph has about when you have a, a piatic L function that's forced to have a trivial zero, looking at the, what can you say about the derivative. And I remember there was, there was some argument there which was along the lines of, well, you, have, you sort of have this two variable thing and you look at, so given that you have the sort of trivial zeros going one way, you sort of can relate the derivative one direction to the derivative of the other direction. Is there some, I mean, did, does this somehow is, is, there, is sort of the idea going into here related to that in some way? That's exactly it, yeah. OK, so that's yeah. sort of where the inspiration comes from? That's exactly, yeah. So the original, um, yeah, the idea comes from, from uh, Ralph and Glenn's proof of the Major Tate title bomb conjecture. And so it's just 
you look, you know, you sort of, you know where it goes in three directions, and so you have all the information. Uh, I don't know. So uh, Sami and uh, Henri Darmon and Rob Pollock have proved this theorem under certain restrictive assumptions, but for p L functions attached to totally real fields. Mm -hmm. And it's totally different. Uh, their proof is um, they sort of in a, it's very closely related to Ribbit's proof of the uh, converse of Herbrand's theorem. They construct, they construct some cohomology class mm -hmm. um, from some rep reducible representation. Uh, but I don't know, I sort of, once we've got that corollary nailed down, we've, we've talked about, I think we're going to look at what happens for totally real fields next, see if there's some generalization from these methods. This may be known to anyone else, but it looks like in the inside of one of the proofs you were discussing, you, it looked like a kind of a piatic version of a stark conjecture-like theorem. Absolutely. What is the status there in terms of what's proved for Stark's conjectures periodically? Uh, so Stark used this theorem, or not Stark, I'm sorry, Gross used this theorem to prove the, what's now known, I guess, as the Gross-Stark conjecture um, over Q. OK, so he, he produces you know, the but unit. A piatic version of the Stark conjecture. Okay, so this will only ever tell you about piatic versions of the Stark conjecture. Um, Sorry, this is the over Q distinction. What's the over Q coming up? Uh, the the character is a, a character of Q bar over Q, right? Uh, so the paper of uh, uh, Darmon, Dasgupta, and Pollock that I just mentioned prove the gross Stark conjecture for characters of totally real fields. Um, yeah, I, I mean it's a it's a big deal. It, it came out a few years ago. It's an it's an annals paper. It's long and it's it's hard and it sort of uses ideas from a lot of different places. I I can't really pretend to know any more than what I've just said about it. But they do they do get this piatic version of the Stark conjecture for totally real fields. Um, more generally, there's a paper that uh, maybe the best one is the elliptic curve case because it's got the form I wanted to have. Uh, there's a, right, so this, this idea of having a, some derivative of a piatic L function equals something times the complex L function, writing it in that form. Usually the something, the log P of Q over ord P of Q is called the L invariant. And um, I think sort of around the same time that Ralph and Glenn proved this, Ralph really made some massive conjecture along this. I mean. You remove elliptic curve character and you just make it some sort of d-dimensional Galois representation, which is ordinary at p. And he wrote down some formula for what should be the L invariant. And of course, for elliptic curves and characters, it specializes to what you want. And then he went on in that paper, uh, in the last section, to go and look at Gross's p-adic version of the Stark conjecture for some character of a totally real field. And then he just induced that character up up to Q or down to Q, I don't know, never know how to say that. And you get some, now you get some d-dimensional representation, right? You have some in, induced character over the, over the extension. And showed that his L invariant predicts the same thing that the gross Stark conjecture does. So this is all sort of uh, very, very much tied up with piatic analogs of, this, of Stark's conjecture. Writes down some some general thing that looks like an L invariant. Does he know? I mean, so one of the important sort of key things is that you need to know that that's non-zero. That's one of the conjectures. It, so it, that's it, so it, it's not clear from his construction, I suppose. No, 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 no. no that's I mean, each time you use you actually you had to use some pretty non-trivial. Oh yeah. Piatic transcendence argument. Right. So I think it's known when you're dealing with a symmetric square of a. Modular form, I think he has proved it's non-zero. Also, uh, Rob Heron has done stuff on that. Mm -hmm. um, Rob Heron's also done sixth powers, sixth symmetric powers of modular forms. And um, he and I have talked a little bit about, uh, he's, he's done higher symmetric powers of CM forms, which actually just reduces to, the, to, to this case for obvious reasons. Um, and so he and I have talked about maybe you know, critical slope, higher symmetric power 
forms. Like, what is there an L invariant there? What can you do? Um, and of course, it, since Ralph wrote that original paper, uh, there have been about four or five different definitions of what the L invariant should be. And I think for a little while, there was actually an industry of going along and like proving that various versions of the L invariant were the same. I mean, uh, several of them just come straight from Piatic Hodge theory. Uh, and maybe those are the most natural ones to look at. I'm not, um, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs>